We're joined now by Deputy Prime Minister and Justice Secretary Dominic Raab. Um, Deputy Prime Minister, is the fact that you're having to have political interference in the parole system an indication that the parole system is broken? Not sure I'd use the word broken, but it's not working as it should be. Yes, I accept that. The model, I don't think, is as effective as it could or should be. And there are three big changes on the parole side of the Victims and Prisoner Bill. One is to get it refocused on what should be its overriding exclusive priority, which is public protection. There has been some drift into this sort of balancing act, if you like, from the public protection and the rights of offenders. I think particularly the most dangerous offenders, that needs to be corrected. It's public protection, which was the aim of the statutory test, and we need to get, get the, uh, uh, the, the test back anchored to that particular focus. The second thing is, one of the interesting things I found is that uh, fewer than, in fewer than one in 20 probable panels, was there a, a, someone with law enforcement experience on the panel? And you think about it from the victims that you've had or the bereaved that you've had on your show, how different it is, if you like, the perspective of a grizzled law enforcement officer uh, who knows what it's like to go and break the heartbreaking news to the, the family uh, of someone that's been murdered or raped or, or something else of that nature. And the importance of having a balanced parole board. So it's not just, and they're important, uh, uh, judicial officers, uh, psychiatrists, social scientists, thinking about the rehabilitation side, but also someone who really understands what risk means in public protection terms. And the final element is for murderers, terrorists, rapists, child killers. I do think it's right, taking a precautionary approach, that ministers have the right to block release in cases where we think that the issue of risk uh, is just too uncertain or, uh, or too high. OK. You say you wouldn't use the word broken, but your own Ministry of Justice statistics say a murder is committed once every six days by a convicted criminal under probation supervision. I mean, how is that not a broken system? Let's talk about one case in particular. Jordan McSweeney, 29 years old, attacked Zara Alina in June last year, nine days after his release on licence from prison. The probation service had blood on its hands, said Zara Alina's aunt. That's a broken system. And you've been in charge yep. since 2010. This is under your government of... 13 years. Well, first of all, I've met with Zara Lina's aunt. Uh, I'm horrified by what Zara Lina went through and what her family has been through. Uh, just as a point of fact, we've accepted all the recommendations from the inspectorate on probation. But just to touch on your point, actually, it was the previous uh, Labour government that gave away the right of veto in parole cases. I think it's clear that is not working in this case and others, um, although this was really about probation rather than parole. But in many other cases that I've looked at, um, I don't think it's working. I think in the last analysis, uh, your viewers uh, already hold me and the politicians to account. They expect us to protect them. And what's important is that we have the means to do it, particularly in those most serious top cohort uh, uh, of offences. And that's what we're delivering today. I, think it, I mean, do you, do you still hold on to the fact you can blame a previous government after 13 years of being in government? I mean, at what point of being in government and having years to fix systems... Do you acknowledge that it is your responsibility, not the government from more than a decade ago? Well, no, I was just pointing out, in fairness, as a point of fact, that that veto was given up by a Labour yeah. government. so you've had 13 years to change well, that. And, and, and actually, uh, I've only been in this post for a fairly limited period of time. Oh, so you're blaming uh, your, we... for, your predecessors? No, no. What I'm saying is, in relation to the manifesto commitment to do reform in this area, a very delicate and sensitive area, we had to have a public consultation. But look, the bottom line is I'm delivering on it today. So, um, I, I, as your Justice Secretary, forgive me, I am, I'm patron of a charity called Support Through Court. And what that charity does is it helps people going through issues of divorce or child custody or personal injury and helps hold their hand through the court process because in England and Wales, there is no longer any legal aid. So people getting divorced or fighting for their children's rights who've got no money um, are often up against highly paid lawyers. I I'm just wondering, as the legal aid system has been cut to shreds, is it really still justice 
if people who don't have the money can no longer fight for justice in our courts up against other people with richly briefed lawyers? Is that the justice system you are in charge of and want to be in charge of? So, first of all, Martin, there's £2 billion that is going into the legal aid system. Civil I think legal many... aid. Civil legal so, aid. Further. Yes. Well, a big chunk of that does go to civil. But, I, look, I appreciate in relation to the family courts, then thank you for the work you're doing with that charity. It's very important. I've had a lot of uh, discussions with civil society. Just on private family law matters, broadly speaking, 55% of the cases that go through the private family law uh, courts involve domestic abuse or safeguarding issues for children. They must go to court. Uh, a judge must look at them. But in relation to the other cases, actually what we're doing is encouraging mediation. Uh, we're also trying to make sure we, we fund and incentivize that and preventing those families where they've got the opportunity. I mean, effectively, we're talking about warring ex-partners, dragging their kids through the additional anguish of court proceedings. We need to get that balance right, but I think encouraging more mediation, which can be very effective, and making sure that more partners resolve those issues and spare their children the anguish, the agony of going to court, the Kramer versus Kramer style battles that we've seen, is critically important. We've just published a consultation on that, and I think that's another but, area of reform well, we're delivering people... on. But when people do go to court and one partner with money to pay for an expensive lawyer is going to court, you leave the other partner undefended, representing themselves with very little help. I ask you a question. Would you say that's a just situation? No, I think it's unfair all round, particularly on the, on, on the kids, which is why I'm saying those cases, unless they involve safeguarding or domestic abuse, should go to mediation and be settled that way. And that doesn't require uh, the drama, the anguish, the trauma of going to court, and certainly doesn't require lots of extra legal fees. It's a smarter way, uh, a sensible way, to resolve those disputes. And we've literally just published our consultation on that. So hopefully you get a sense that we are trying to grapple with that. Dominic Robert, we have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Thank you very much indeed um, for Thanks. joining us this morning. Thank you.